Okay, so thank you very much for your time here today. And thank you for coming um, despite the last day of the workshop. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, so this workshop is, is very wonderful and enjoyed it very much. And, and thanks again for organizing this workshop and uh, giving me an opportunity to give my presentation here. Okay, so um, anyway, so I want to today I want to talk about some adaptivity of a neural network, and especially I will talk about the feature learning aspect of deep learning and how beneficial it is to estimate some functions. So and this is uh, the uh, the plan of my presentation. So so as I said, so in this presentation I will discuss the feature learning of neural network. Uh, to to discuss that, so I will talk some three parts of the talk. And in the first part, so I will talk something, I will discuss something about uh, the unlike smoothness of the target function. And uh, the deep learning has on some adaptivity to capture such an unlike smoothness. And in the second one, so we extend that to a kind of infinite dimensional settings. And if I have some, if, if, I, have, if I have some time, and I will talk about the optimization guarantee of the neural networks in the other part. But, but uh, I will, only talk about uh, uh, well abstract of that third part because I don't have that much time. Okay, so let's move on there and the details. Okay, so so in this presentation, so I will talk only the non-parametric regression problem, so in which the output y i is given by f not x i plus uh, noise g z i. So we assume that g z i is an i i d Gaussian and xi is from zero one unit cube in a d-dimensional space. So this is our settings. And suppose that we have n data points, xi, yi, from i equal one to n, so then we construct an estimator f hat. And as a performance measure of the estimator, we employ the mean squared error. So this, that is given by the ex expect expectation with the square of the L2 distance between f hat and f naught, and the expectation is taken over the realization of the training data. So this is not a random variable, so this is a deterministic variable. Yeah, so then so we compare this mean squared error between the deep learning and the other methods, and we discuss how, which is better. So yeah, so you know, so the mean squared error is an excess risk zero to the low, uh, squared loss. Okay. So um, there are, in the literature, there are many, many works that compares the shallow and the deep methods. And here are uh, some few um, studies that discuss the, the, the kind of benefit of a deep learning in a non-parametric regression settings. Uh, for example, so in this work, so Imaizumi and Fukumi show that if the true function is included in a piecewise smooth function class, so then the deep learning can outperform the common method. Another one is the uh, true function is included in a Bessel space, then deep can be better than a common method. So, and so today uh, I will focus on some low dimensional structure of the input data. Okay. Okay. So, um, so you will know that the typical non parametric regression, uh, non parametric convergence rate is given by like this. The rate of convergence is characterized by the smoothness of the target function and the dimensionality of the input. So if the dimension of the input is very, very large, so then the convergence rate becomes very, very slow. So this is called the curse of dimensionality. So this, that is a well-known result. But in reality, so deep learning works well, even for the image data set, which is very high dimensional. So why is it? So a typical explanation for that is that, so data is distributed on some low dimensional manifold. So actually the experimental results show that the intrinsic dimensionality of the MNISO data set is like 13 or 14. Okay, so that is good. And, and also the, the, in the literature of the manifold learning, it is shown that if the data is distributed on capital D dimensional, low dimensional manifold, so then the rate of convergence can be improved like this. So instead of a small D, the, the dimensionality of the whole space the capital D, the dimensionality of the low dimensional manifold comes, comes in the rateable components. So that means that in the MNIST data set, so instead of 784, 13 or 14 is coming here. So if the smoothness S is sufficiently right, so it is a reasonable number. But a, a little bit, this is a little bit restrictive. So because the data must be distributed on exactly on the low dimensional manifold. So if the data is 
a little bit outside of the manifold, so such an analysis cannot be applied. So therefore, so here, so I would like to consider a little bit extended situations, so like this. So for example, so let us consider some, some situation where the data has some noise, so then data can be easily um, outside of the manifold. And maybe, so you can consider some data augmentations. So then in that same settings, the data also can be easily outside of the manifold. So, okay, so then in that settings, maybe so we can think that the true function has a different smoothness depending on the directions. So maybe so the true function has a low smoothness along with the direction of the low dimensional manifold, that it, it would be very, very smooth to the direction which is perpendicular to the manifold because it is just, just a noise. So it, it, it is non-informative. So to, to that direction, which is also to the manifold, so we, we can somehow neglect. So that can be characterized by the, the direction dependent smoothness. That means that it has smoothness S1, S2, S3, according, along with the, the, uh, the local coordinate on the manifold, and the S1 and S2 are smaller than S3. So S3 is a smoothness to the direction, which is also similar to the manifold. And to that direction, that, that true function does not move so much. So that means that true function is very, very smooth to that direction. Okay. <clears throat> So yeah, so to capture this kind of notion, so we want to so define something like a unaspecific smooth function class. I guess you are a, a bit familiar with these kind of notions. So here, so I introduce an unaspecific Bessel space. So formally, it is defined like this. So yeah, so better uh, due to the time limitation. So I don't go much details anyway. So uh, at the first. Uh, okay, at the first, here is the modular smooth smoothness that, that this measures how smooth function is. And this is a kind of a differentiations, a kind of a discretized differentiations. And next, so you can see that there is a parameter S1 to SD. So this determines the, the direction dependent smoothness. Okay? And the modular smooth smoothness is measured uh, with these resolutions, okay? So the resolution is, is modified by S1 to SD, and then the modular smoothness is uh, computed. So, but this is a little bit uh, complicated. So here is just some very um, intuitive um, uh, uh, alternative combination. So this is not exactly the same as the definition of the unanswered resource. This is just an intuition. This is just an intuition. Okay. No, no, I'll no, say. Uh, so it is not equivalent up to the constant function. I think maybe if you, there's some, there is some relationship I've seen before. That's an analogy. So yeah, that's an analogy. So it's not the exact yeah. So so this is an atmospheric solar space, and so we cannot show the uh, uh, so atmospheric solar space is included in an atmospheric vessel space and vice versa. So yeah. Uh, I guess for P equals Q equals two, that's the one case where everything. Yes, that's right. That's a um, very special, very special case. Yes, that's right. That, that much is uh, not so well, yeah. well, I, I thought that the Bessel space norms could be written in two ways, and that this is the way that's handy for thinking about wavelets. Right, right, right. Uh, oh, there is some other way to write it. Okay. So, yeah, so there are many ways to define the Bessel space, yes. the frequency space. Uh, yeah, but this is a more uh, classic number. Uh, yes. Can I ask uh, the Q? The Q is less than infinity uh, here, yes. but uh, can it be less than one? Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, so it can, uh, Q can be less than one. So uh, uh, Q is uh, greater than zero, and Q can be infinity. So, so zero to infinity. Okay. But, but to, to to develop some estimation uh, error bound. So we, we needed some assumptions on the queue. Uh, but, uh, so, so, so in this definitions, uh, we don't require. Okay. But queue does not play so much. Um, well, or P, I mean, also P is, uh, uh, can P be less than one? Yes. So, yeah, so if P is less than one, so this is not normal. So this is like a, 
Also quasi, quasi so. enorm, ja. Yes. So, okay, so this is an intuitive like uh, interpretation of like um, an aspect solar space. Okay, so we calculate uh, SI times differentiation to the ice coordinate, and we we and we take its LP norm like this. So therefore, the SI represents something like a smooth density ice coordinate. <laughs> and so another important point is we are taking the LP norm here. So P, if P is infinity, so we have uh, some uniform bound of the derivative. So we have a uniform smoothness of the function in the space. But if P is small, like one or smaller than one, so then we only have a guarantee of a guarantee that the other age of that derivative is bounded. So the function is not uniformly smooth. Maybe at some point that function could be very deviated, but the other age is bounded. So yeah, therefore the P represents something like a uniformity of the smoothness of the functions. So there are important two factors. And the Q does not play so much uh, deep, uh, important role. So. I don't explain it so much. So there are many, um, well, well, literature about uh, estimating, estimating our um, atmospheric, uh, estimating a function with the atmospheric smoothness. Uh, actually, we can go back to 1980s, and Ibrahimov, Ibrahimov Hatsminski showed the minimax optimal rate for density estimation with atmospheric smoothness, and there are many other uh, works. But uh, so what we want to do here is not to estimate a single function in our atmospheric vessel space, but we want to estimate a uh, composition of the functions in an atmospheric vessel space. So that, that is a difference from uh, the uh, classic literatures. Okay, so we assume that a true function can be written by the composition of the functions in an atmospheric vessel space. And in each layer, the HL is a multi input multiple input and multiple output functions. Therefore, each output the, it corresponds to the function in an unstable basal space. The smoothness is characterized by SL. So SL represents the smoothness in the else layer. So SIL is a smoothness in the ice layer to the ice coordinate. Okay. So by considering this model, so we can deal with the figure I presented in the last slide, yeah, like this. In the first layer, we extract a coordinate in on the manifold. On top of that, we put an uh, unaspect uh, function on an unaspect basal space. So then we can deal with this kind of very skewed um, coordinates. Okay, so for these settings, we we fit a deep neural network to the model. Okay, uh, that so we consider a deep neural network with some widths and depths. And by modulating the, the, the coefficient, and we fit this model to the data. For a links into individual neurons, or is the total number of links altogether? Individual, so, you mean? Uh, each neuron has a certain number of inputs. Yes, yes. So is that S, or is it the total number of links across the whole network? Well, you mean S? S. Oh, S. Ah, oh, yes, okay, okay, yeah. S represents a total number of non zero. Yeah, yeah. Oh, on the whole network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So there are many, there are conveniently very many possibilities of that uh, realization. Oops, thank you. And so, okay, so this is some more details. Okay. Uh, so this is a model, so it functions a composition of the unlisted resource spaces. And then, so we consider the least squares estimators. So we perform the least squares estimation. In the set of the neural networks, so with some some restriction of the depth and width and the number of non-zero components, the weights, and the artificial function is a derivative. Can I ask another question yeah. here? So that that Bessel norm expression, I was set up to be, take advantage of wavelets, uh, yeah. provide an algorithm to do minimizations if you only had. Not a composition, but just one such. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to, instead of restricting to these networks, to just do, you know, uh, the minimization over the vessel spaces? Uh, yeah, yes, yes, we can, we can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Is it, in fact, here you don't know if this is computationally feasible. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'll address that. But if you were to do the minimization over 
the whole composition of Bessel Falls, I see. would that be computationally feasible by some way? Well, I, I, I don't think it is computationally feasible. So yeah, because this is an atmospheric. Yeah, there may be too many terms, but it might even be possible to express by some multivariate wavelet explicitly. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, because this is now for compositions and no one's ever done that. Yeah. But that would be natural to ask. But I, I think it is already a deep learning. <laughs> Instead of little activations, we use a wavelet basis, a wavelet basis, yes. a kind of a that may be more natural. So of course we can do that, but I, I'm thinking a little more about that. Uh, well, more popular settings. So, uh, well, it's good to do both. It's good to ask what is the right math for something, I see. and what fits popular. I see. I see. I see. Uh, yeah, I agree. Agree. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't want to further interrupt. Yeah, but I I do feel like uh, once you have the composition structure, these. They're called Nemitsky operators, right? The composition operators, they're nonlinear, which is when you have to differentiate through, you get into all these. Uh, so it's not even a multilinear function in each of the composition uh, components. If you were to try to do this. Yeah, to do something coordinate wise or. Yeah. Mm, oh, that, that's interesting. So let's discuss. Yeah. Sarah? Yeah. So the non zero edges, do you know where they are? No, no. Um, it, it is also so term there then with, with the capital S. Ah, so you mean the number S is known for no, the, no, the, the location? Location, no. So we optimize that. So when S is a constraint, then under that constraint, we find the best location of the non zero parameters. So, yeah, so. But the capital uh, S does not appear in your bound Capital S. It is coming here, but in the bound on the yeah, theorem. On the bound. Oh, okay. So I, I should say that. So here, so please look at here. So then with an appropriate setting of L, W, S, and P is also bound on the parameter. So we need to choose L, W, and S. So they are numbers depending on the parameter size. So maybe so you can do magnitude cross validation or something like that. So there are some appropriate size of the model that can depend on the sample size. But the optimization itself can be done uh, without the, the knowledge of uh, the exact location of the non zero. Is it clear? Okay. 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 So, um, yeah. So, then this is our the estimator. So, what are you considering? Yeah, of course, uh, we can consider some other estimators, but that here we just we can consider very deep neural network. Which is hidden in the less sim. Uh, here, yes, it's a constant. Yeah. It depends exponentially on. Yeah, I, I should I should admit that it, it, it has an exponential dependency. Okay. That is a Victor lock. Yeah. So yeah, well, it's what you get with this assumption. Yeah. So, I think it's uh, when you say it's minimax optimal, is that to within the log factor, or is even the cube of the log part of the minimax optimal uh, plane? Uh, up to log. So. The minimum size, okay. there is no log. That would be super impressive if you're able <laughs> to resolve. Uh, so, yeah, the constant and log factor. Yeah. So, yeah, like in the usual situation. Yeah, so, so you have already understood that slide. So, I, I, I want to say something about that. Uh, something like so, so, the, the rhythm model is uh, characterized by S tilde of L. So, this is given by the inverse or the sum of the inverse of the smoothness to each direction. Okay, so basically, so this determines the convergence rate. But the, 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 the actual convergence rate is characterized by a, something like a, a little bit modified the parameter S tilde star L. So that is given by like this. So because uh, some errors in the internal layers can is, is propagated to the output. So such a propagation should be taken into account. So that is coming here. So, but any, anyway, so basically the rate of convergence is characterized by S tilde. So, like the, the uh, choosing P such that that product thing goes away and the S to star is the same as that S tilde. Would that be advantageous to choose a P that makes that product factor go away? P? Yeah, you see, you have min SK 
That's J K minus one over P. Oh, okay. So if you choose the right P, those will just be ones, right? I see. I see. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. So is that but, somehow good. But um, here, so that I I uh, we, I have a assume that P is given, but but yeah, but you're choosing it. <laughs> P is given, so because yeah, the true function. You never know what it is. So if you're if you your procedure is somehow using it. Uh, not explicitly, not, uh, okay. not explicitly, and right. this is just appearing in the radio one. So, but what we should, but what we should set is just L W S and V. Okay. So yeah, of course, in, in inside L and S, and there is a P. And yeah. In practice, yeah, they so just like do some just doing cross validation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So there are something. Like so can I just the structure of your bound? Yeah. Okay. So so this bound it it has the plus one. Plus one. Oh, one. Yes, yes, yes. So it means uh, with this mixed regularity assumption uh, in this anisotropic uh, Nikolsky type spaces, you essentially get uh, uh, down to a univariate to a one dimensional uh, yeah. regression rate. You can you can consider in that sense. Yeah, but you could, could you could I think I could ask now my question. Um, so if you have a blockwise anisotropic smoothness, for example, you don't have one-dimensional uh, mix regularity, but you know that your variables separate in groups, say of dimension d1, d2, d3, and so on. Will you then also get? Uh, you should get here instead of plus one. Uh, the max over all oh, L plus okay. DL or something. You're considering the mixed smoothness in some groups. Yeah, because and unless we smooth this across this, the this is you have a, a, like a lot of variables, and then usually uh, the function depends isotropically on on some variables, which are weakly coupled to some other variable. Mm -hmm. So you have this mixed regularity, but not between variable one, two, three, four, five, but uh, say with knocks. Of course, but isn't that just a special case of this case? Because he could have a sequence that goes in steps, and then his result would still. You know, the plus one. The question is. You know, the plus, plus one, one should, should then become a plus, plus DL. So it is like the block. With a different L. S star tilde L. With his S star L tilde, you can still write it down because it's just a special case of this case. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't have, what assumption is your sequence? It could be. Constant and then down and constant and down. Yes. Constant. It's just so a special case. The, the, the whole thing is in an unspecified smoothness. So then, so yeah, as you said, so uh, such a setting is also come out of this. So, yeah, maybe. So only you lose only one log here when you go down to one dimension. But, but so, so let us consider very extreme case, like if it's not L to S M L L are same like S. So then mm -hmm. this becomes like s divided by n d. So this becomes s divided by d. So this becomes like s divided by d. Yes. Therefore, by multiplying d, uh, multiplying the denominator, d appears here. Yeah. And then the, also the exponent of the log uh, n will, will then be not 3, but some um, dl or something. Yeah. No, um, th this is not a, a mean smoothness. This is an unless smoothness. This is not a tensor product. Setting. So, uh -huh. so this is a different for mixed smoothness. So, yes. if, if you consider the mixed smoothness, so then you're right. So, instead of this one, so the smallest S1 or some with some multiplication, you come here and some actual log n um, d times one minus n or something like that. So, that, that appears. Yeah. But this is a different setting. So, yeah, it, it doesn't appear. Continue. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's another thing. Thank you for pointing out. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, we have this major problem. So, uh, so this is an inverse, a sum inverse point. So, um, yeah. So now, so, uh, so, uh, so I should say that this is um, a kind of a um, direct generalization of the result by Schmidt Huber, two thousand nineteen. Well, it, it has already appeared in the analysis of statistics. But he considered the composition of the Helder space. But this is an kind of extension to the anisotropic basal spaces. So in that sense, this is a direct extension. So okay, and so this is a, a very um, well a specific settings where h equal one. So the uh, one layer settings. So then the rate of homogeneity is given like this. So so suppose 
uh, settings, consider settings where S1 is small and the other S2 to SD are very large. So then S2 is almost like S1. So it, it only depends on the one direction smoothness. So then that, that there doesn't appear the, uh, the dimensionality in the rate. But if you consider isotropic vessels like S1 equal ST equal S, then the D appears here from this theorem. So then uh, you suffer from the cause of dimensionality. So therefore, the unspeak smoothness is important to avoid the uh, uh, effect of the dimensionality. Okay. The first example that you mentioned that's one very small and all the other big. Uh, so the D minus one dimension doesn't appear in the rate, but does it appear in the log or in the constant? Yeah, uh, I'm so sorry. So, uh, uh, in the first example that you say, there's one very small, uh, yeah. the other big. Yeah, yeah. So you have one dimension with a low regularity and D minus one dimensions with high regularity. Yeah. D minus one, does it appear somewhere in the log term or? Uh, yeah, maybe, yes, yes. Log term, or, not log term, but in a constant. Uh, there must be. Well, actually, it is, if you let D go to infinity, you get to the other case. So it still blows up. Yes, yes, that's right. So D minus one eventually will take over the other one. Right, right. So, the, so as I said, the constant depends on the D. So, so it, it's not so obvious that we can so, so diverse, we can make D diverse. We cannot do that. You have this assumption that S tilde L bigger than one over P. Hmm? Oh. So it can't really blow up. Ah, so sorry, could it blow up? Could you say it is? Yeah, yeah, that's the smoothness. It's it's sufficiently large, so uh, yeah, yeah. some some blowing so, up completely. Yeah, yeah, if P is very really small, so yeah. it can be less than one, so it can be as large as you wish. In no. those classes. Uh, well, that's good. I mean, then it won't blow up, or am I? Mean, yeah, no, I think I I learned. I understood what your comment to my comment is. This is the thing. This is the assumption that's critical. Yeah. The S star. The S till the L being bigger than one over P. Yeah. So this is an that makes it dimension function in an infinity space. So, yeah. To, to confirm that the functions in a in function in each layer is included in the infinity space, we need these assumptions. So if the S theta is smaller than one, uh, this one, so then it is no longer included in the infinity space. But at some extent, so we have some integralities like it, it could be included in L, L2 or L out integrals. So we don't have a interesting stuff, but I would like you to continue. Okay, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, so okay, so I have a bound, so it's okay. Uh, but next so we want to compare the bound for the deep running to the other expanders. Uh, be fixed feature um, estimators like a counter method. So, as a representative of such a non adaptive, non feature running method, so we consider linear estimators. So, so, I'm, so, this is a kind of analogous to classic argument by Donohue and Johnston. So, they, they consider uh, some adaptivity or wavelet shrinkage. So, yeah, this analogy is based very similar to that work. Okay, so so this is the definition of the linear estimators. Okay, so if the estimator has this form, so which is linear to the output yi, so then we can say it is a linear estimator. So it can be non-linear with respect to the input x, but but if it is linear to the output yi, or for i equal one to n, so then it is a linear estimator. So the, maybe it's in machine learning literature. So the most important example is the kernel rich regressions. So, you, so it is obviously linear to the output yi. So this is a linear estimator. So, so, so here, so we fix a kernel function beforehand. So, the, so then the, the, the features is fixed. So there's no feature running. So therefore, so we can say this is a kind of a fixed feature method. So other exam in interesting example is like uh, Navarre Watson estimators and the K nearest neighbor estimators. So all of them are included in the uh, linear estimators. So now we compare the performance uh, between the, the linear estimators and the, the deep learning. Uh, for that purpose, uh, we restrict ourselves to a, a little bit well, rest, uh, more simpler situations. Okay, so this is a very much more simple situation. 
So, that, so suppose that the true function is written by the composition of uh, isotropic base of function and uh, uh, affine transformation, Wx plus b. So you know, we assume that Wx plus b is always inside uh, some, some unit, unit q. Okay. And here, w is a kind of projection to the low dimensional subspace. So, cap, so we assume capital D is smaller than the small d, the whole space. So then the b's are some vectors. So for this function class, so we consider the minimax optimum rate with respect to the linear estimators. So then we have this raw bound. Okay. So this is. U of ah, okay. U is U. Unit of all. Unit of all. Yeah, uh -huh. I should say that. So unit of all. Is this your new result or is this. Uh, this is my. What is it most like? What techniques are you using? Oh, well, okay. So I, I should just explain that. <laughs> yeah. I, so maybe so before I compare this, but I maybe I just bring some the proof techniques. Okay. So the proof technique is like this. Uh, this is, so I, I have used a so called convex hull argument. So this is a kind of a weakened technique uh, that was used by John Donovan and Johnson. So anyways, so the minimax rate of the linear estimators. It's the same as the minimum rate on the convex hull of the target function class F. Okay, so as far as you are using the linear estimators, so so it is dealing with as if like the convex hull of our uh, target function. So if the target function class is highly non-convex like this, so then by taking its convex hull, there are a huge gap uh, between the, the, the actual minimum rate or or all other estimators and uh, that on the linear estimators. So that, that is a trick, okay? So then, um, so, okay, so if the target function class is an also normal system, so the, I mean like a wavelet, uh, uh, so it, it's, a, it's a, a kind of linear combination of the, of the wavelet basis function, so then it, it, we can, so this convex hull can be altered by the Q hull, so which is known as more larger than the convex hull, but, but here, so in our settings, uh, so we, we cannot apply that, uh, so the, 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 the situation is, is not uh, suit for this analysis. So we use this uh, a, a little bit weak uh, 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 statement. But anyway, so we can show that the convex hull of this function class contains a, well, a Gaussian kernel with a small boundary this, like this. So you, 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 you know you, you can see that the, this function class does not contain the, this kind of uh, well RBF functions so because the, the function in this class depends on just only a few directions so it doesn't uh, contain the Gaussian colors but by taking its convex hull so like uh, taking rotations or something like that then we can show that it contains a Gaussian color like this so it it, con it induces some high frequency component. So to show that, I have used the EDA Miyake's integral representation. So it's a, like a classic result. So I think this is very much related to the balance uh, your function class. But but the convex so the, the convex hull of this function class is uh, it's smaller than I think the function uh, baron class. Okay. okay. So now so we compare the rate of components for deep learning and the linear estimators. Uh, the, the, for, by using the previous uh, results, the rate of convergence for the deep learning can be written by like this. Instead of small d, the capital D comes here. So if the capital D is small, the, the convergence rate is fast. But uh, as I said, uh, the rate of convergence for the linear estimators is lower bounded by like this. So yeah, if S is moderately large, we can show that the rate of convergence of the deep learning can be faster than the linear estimators. So this is uh, because of the cosmo dimension. So because you can see that in the lower bound of the linear estimators, there appears a small d in the rate of convergence. So this is very effect. This affects the uh, convergence rate. So, so for the high dimensional settings, uh, there appears a big difference. Okay. So this, this is just a small remark. If you small, capital D equals small d, so there appears this uh, comparison. So this is a classic. Uh, comparison appearing in the Donohoe and the Johnston's paper. So they analyzed uh, uh, the, uh, the effectiveness of the wavelet shrinkage. So, so this is the rate of convergence for the wavelet shrinkage, and this is the rate of convergence for the, um, the linear estimators. But, 
I skip this one. Okay, so this kind of non-convexity, that a convex argument can be applied to many other existing works, like uh, uh, piecewise smooth functions and uh, so variable smooth vessel space. Uh, so, so there are some other uh, results. So yeah, so all of them can be explained by this uh, convex argument. So uh, to show the superiority of the deep learning, so the non-convexity of the model is very important. So it, it, once we can check the non-convexity, so then it is rather easy to show the difference between the deep and the shallow method. Uh, so. Ten minutes. Oh, 10 minutes, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so next, I'm, uh, so I'm going to go to one. Kind of uh, general settings. I think I'm not going to the optimization section, so I just I will finish on this part. Okay. <clears throat> well, okay. So so far we have considered finer dimensional settings. As we have discussed, the constant hidden in the rate of the convergence there is a dependency on the dimensionality d, and and also it is exponential. So we cannot directly we cannot uh, so naively extend that to infinite dimensional settings. We cannot take D to infinity because the constant diverges. So, but, but we want to deal with the infinite dimensional settings because in reality, uh, we need to deal with uh, the image data or some audio data. So they are almost infinite dimensional. So we, we want to do that. So in the yesterday, that's Sophia talk, uh, gave a very interesting talk about image classification, but this is a bit of different direction. So this is a, a more on that. I'm going to speak to the next action. Okay. Yeah. So these uh, psi i, they are i i d, uh, and the sigma, uh, is, the sigma, the variance is of the noise is uh, fixed. Yeah. Yeah, fixed. Yes. Ci yeah. is uh, i. Yes. So this is a uh, well. Oh, well, so standard normal distribution setting. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So then you go with this uh, setting of infinite number of parameters just below. Yes. That is the only difference. So, mm -hmm. uh, the input excites are just infinite dimensional C mass. We wouldn't call them parameters, we would call them the input variables. Yeah, but uh, the noise components then all have the same variance uh, for all coordinates. So it is like a cylindrical. Uh, it's not, Usually this is what we start with and then you after you look at your result and you say, ah, this will work if the sigma of X is um, are bounded by some sigma squared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The xi in zero one infinity, this means not the coordinate, this means the whole sequence Yeah, so in this bubble on top. Fixed i. Well, fixed i is in zero one. Each each xi is a, is an image or a function. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. In zero one infinity. So each one. xi is a sequence. Yes. Well, yeah. So this it can be. It is just an infinite number of um, real numbers. So you have infinite data. You have a function. Like an image or a function. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So this is one image. Right? For example, so uh, let us consider image data. So by applying a Fourier transform on the CNN, so we have a uh, almost infinite many coefficient Fourier Fourier coefficient uh, or wavelet coefficient. So that is given by x. Yeah. So but uh, uh, I admit that there is a strong uh, assumption that uh, uh, x has a distribution px and which has a which is absolutely continuous with respect to the Rubeck measure or I think other than uniform distribution of the zero one, uh, uh, zero one infinity group. So this is a very strong assumption that uh, the analysis we have achieved this one. But anyway, so we have an infinite sequence. This is a kind of infinite dimensional vectors, which is fed in the function. Then we have an output. So we want to estimate this function by DB network. So yeah, so the situation is like that. So we have an image and we have a kind uh, of feature extraction, then we have an awesome output. Okay. 
so there are many um, related works in the literature. So yeah, so I, I cannot explain all of them. But, but the, the most re relevant work is uh, given by Ingustan and Stefanova. So they they published a series of papers like this, and they considered uh, an asymmetric solid space in the infinite dimension space, and considered some significant tests and estimation error bound. Yeah, so the function class we consider is very related to their, their ones. Okay, so this is a function class that we consider as a target function class. Okay. So as I said, we cannot use the anastrophic vessel space because there appears a big constant. So to deal with infinite dimensional space, so we change the function class like this. But here, psi i is given by the, the product of psi i i x i. So x i is the i's component of the x. And psi i i is a cosine or a sine, uh, which has a frequency to pi i i. So i i, so yeah, i i is a, like a frequency. So it is known that the psi i is uh, also, uh, uh, consists of the, uh, also normal, uh, so, sorry, sorry, co completely also normal system. So yeah, so L2 function f can be decomposed into like this. For this decomposition, uh, we um, extract one component, delta sf. So delta sf uh, represents uh, some component, sub, sub, sub component, which has a frequency around the two to SI, about two to SI. So where S is an infinite sequence of natural numbers, we extract some frequency component like this. For each this frequency component, we calculate its LP norm with respect to the Rubeck measure. And then we impose some penalty on the, the frequency, like that it is given by two to the gamma S, two to gamma S. So the gamma S is supposed to be monotonically increasing. As S goes, as S goes up, I, I mean, uh, as a frequency goes up, then penalty uh, becomes larger. So, so then the function f in this function class is guaranteed to be smooth. Okay, so in, so in our work, we consider two situations of a gamma s. So one is a gamma s is the sum of s i a i, where a i is a sum given parameters, and another example is a gamma s is a max of s i a i. So to the analogy of some analysis in you know, approximation theory. So we say this settings as a mixed smoothness, we say this settings as an anastrophic smoothness. So, but, so there is a, some formal definition of a mixed smooth sober space, but uh, this function class is not exactly the same as that function class, but, but this is just an analogy to that. So this is a naming from just us, so this is not a guarantee uh, or accepted by many other guys. So this is just an analogy. Okay. So the, roughly speaking, this parameter AI it's the same as SI in the previous slide. So AI represents the smoothness to the ice coordinate. Yeah. Tained? Maximum? Maximum, that's a supremum. Yeah, this must be soup, yes. Sometimes it could be even. But SS is a cosine of SI. And this is a natural number. And AI is also positive. So it is lower bounded by zero. And so maybe it can be infinity. but Anyway, so so okay. it's okay. So, so. Yeah, so, so if it is if gamma s is so, so then this term should be zero. Okay. So, yeah. So that frequency component has not up here. Okay. Yes. Okay. So then let's move on to the next slide. Okay. <laughs> well, um, yeah. So I know this. Uh, 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 Notations we can derive our appropriation error by neural network. Okay. Okay, so now we assume that AI is monotonically increasing. AI is monotonically increasing. That, that means uh, uh, the smoothness to the highest coordinate will increase. So, in, in other words, the first coordinates are the most important, and the second coordinate is the, uh, the second important. So, for example, let us consider some, some image classification. So, image is uh, uh, we apply the Fourier transform to the image. So then X is aligned. So X represents, uh, X1 represents the ro lowest frequency. And as the index goes up, so then the frequency goes up. So this means that the function F is more, more sensitive to low frequency component of the input. But if the function F is, that is not so sensitive to high frequency component of the input. So yeah, in, 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 
in practice, it, it should be like that. So uh, the, in the machine learning settings, there are some input and output uh, relation must be sensitive to the outline of the function. Uh, it, it must be not so sensitive to uh, the high frequency uh, difference or uh, the input image. So under these assumptions, we have this uh, approximation error. Okay, yeah, so, so yeah. The, on the right side, the norm is squared, yeah. Squared. Ah, yes, yes, you're right. So the norm is squared. And then also the measure is the, the measure in L2, what measure? Uh, 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 measures, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, th this is a, a metric with the Rubik measure, but uh, we are assuming that the density function of the PX is bounded. So the same bound is also uh, applied to the, the distribution of the PX. Okay. So this measure, what you is lambda infinity. Uh, yes, yes, that's right. Okay. Lambda infinity. So it, is a, it can be seen as an infinite product of a uniform distribution. Yeah, but it's not the back measure. So you get this for these neural nets. What more simple structure would be? Uh, could you get the same uh, yeah. approximation for? Yes, yes. So, um, so you you see that here is some something like a soup or uh, or something like this. So yes. then um, there is some cut off of S. So yeah. So uh, so we can find some cut off of S. So if uh, gamma S is smaller than no, no, uh, okay, so, okay, so like a sum of S1, uh, oh, okay, sorry, sorry, I forgot some details about it. Uh, so if S satisfies, well, gamma S is smaller than some variable, and then so we extract it, that delta S, that satisfies, okay, so remember that delta S and it's like that. So we, we correct uh, all delta S that satisfies some threshold, so that is a big old some threshold. So it's like a low pass filter. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. So, then, so you keep only certain frequency blocks. So then the, the, this proof, the, 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 the proof goes on just uh, approximated this uh, product of science. So what would be the advantage of the neural net versus just using that low pass filter? Yeah, of course, uh, in practice, so you can use, uh, of course, this, uh, well, uh, low pass filter can be used, but this is a, a, a a kind of well understanding the practice success of the neural network. Yeah, yeah, I get that, but it, it would be useful to know whether there is some advantage of the neural net. No, okay. Uh, well, so, so far, so in terms of this, um, um, well, approximation errors. So if we know that target function is something like this, so that there's no advantage. So I should say there's no advantage. Yeah. So it's the adaptability. Yeah. Okay. Just, just, um, well. Well, the, the one advantage is just, even though we don't know the exact function class, so we can apply it. So right. we, we use some constant. Yeah, I should say that. So the radical components, because of the, of the high adaptivity, there is a huge, um, well, constant in the components rate. So it, the neural network can apply to the unlimited vessel space, and it can also apply to this function class. So we don't need, but we don't need to know which basis functions like a way we let well cosine sine whatever else we can do fine but we do some constant so that is a disadvantage of econ so yeah I should say that so yeah okay so I'm sorry I'm sorry I know we've asked lots of questions but you will still need to wrap up shortly so yeah and I have only that's the two slides so excellent go ahead I can finish my you know minutes. Okay, so based on that, uh, so I had to say some uh, the approximation theory. So anyway, so, so we have this kind of estimation error. Yes, so by, by using the uh, approximation error bound, so we can reach this, this kind of estimation error. So by choosing the model size appropriately, so then we have this rate of confidence. And you can see that the, uh, uh, the rate of confidence is, is capitalized by the so called alpha gamma, which is written, which appears in the Okay, so in this line, so alpha gamma is defined by uh, this one. So for the least smoothness, alpha gamma is defined by, by one over one, one over a1. And for the unmetric smoothness, alpha gamma is the sum of one over a i. So this completely um, related, uh, well, corresponds to the S tilde we have considered in the previous slide. So yeah. So then, so anyway, so we have this rate. So here is the alpha gamma inverse that is on a1 in a smoothness. 
And the shares are found on the inverse. So the rest is denoted by A theta. So A theta is given by the inverse of the sum of A and A plus. So, yeah. And how many calories is coming here? So, this is a very uh, a kind of extension of the previous result. One, one, one drawback is that here's an additional term minus b. The b is given by uh, max or one over p minus one over two and zero. So, uh, uh, I think we can get rid of this one, but then so far we have. We did not do that. One question. Do you still need the sparsity constraint in your network structure? or? Ah, uh, yes. Yes, yes. Okay. I didn't say that. So that... No, no, no worries. I was just wondering because I only saw the, the bounds on the width and the length. So, yeah, okay. okay. But recently, there are some some uh, some studies that doesn't require the sparsity. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can do that. So okay. So finally, so I, I, in the previous slide, I have assumed that AI is increasing, so monotonically increasing. But uh, we want to relax that. For that purpose, we the assumption is relaxed or something like that. So AI is robotized by log i, but it, so as long as it is robotized by log i, so it can be up and down. But if you sort AI in a decreasing order, uh, so sorry, increasing order, so then AIJ, J's smallest AI <laughs> is smaller than by J to the power of Q. So this is an assumption. So maybe, so AJ1, this is the smallest AI, but maybe this is the second smallest AJ, uh, AI, and maybe this is the third smallest AI. But it is not order, but this can be spread out in wide range of different. So then, so we need to do something like feature instructions. So we need to find which features are important. So we, to which direction the function is not so smooth. We need to find that. To to do that, we can use the linear convolutions. So by applying convolution in some layers. So then, so we can show that. So this is a kind of puzzle, and so the convolution can do something like a feature extractions. Then after that, so the extractive feature is fed into the uh, neural network. Then we obtain the same rate of the convergence in the uh, more restrictive assumptions. So, yeah. Uh, if in a fully connected neural network, fully in a fully connected neural network. So, yeah. But, but apply to the linear. There's no, yes, no uh, nonlinearity. No, no, no. Okay, so that's it. So I skip the. Uh, well, so yeah, there's some humanitarian range and I to optimize the neural network. I escaped this one. <laughs> so, okay, so uh, this is a conclusion. I have uh, discussed uh, a bit the so benefit of efficient lines and then compared uh, uh, the estimation error bound between the deep and the shallow, uh, no pixel feature methods. So, and the uh, advantage is coming from the non complexity of the target function class. And by using the uh, complex power argument, we have shown some demands. There are many features, but yeah, we do my